college uh, player. I, I ran the camp circuit and uh, spent my summers working at camps and being around it. Um, I spent a few years as um, an assistant, a volunteer assistant at uh, Stevens uh, Tech in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, I worked with some youth programs out there in uh, New Jersey as well, uh, in Montclair area, and then went out to, to Chicago and coached uh, there for about three years, everything from their uh, Team Illinois at the high level down to their youth, youth learn to play and, and youth clinics and, and did that. Um, and then uh, 12, um, I guess 14, 15 years ago, uh, when I moved here to Georgia, uh, I, I met up with uh, Lou and uh, Coach Buck is here and um, got involved and started the first program uh, with Lou through in Forsyth County, uh, through McGattaway, and the first program in Gwinnett County, um, and have been involved uh, in, in that Lambert and South area for several years, and then just a few years ago, uh, moved into the Cambridge um, district. Uh, so, I've uh, been uh, very involved. I've uh, worked with Ken Lovick here for the last uh, 10, 12 years and running the Georgia Tech camp and, and run a camp up in Wisconsin as well uh, with my brother. So, have, Who's your uh, brother? Uh, my brother is uh, Joe Alberici, the head coach at West Point. Uh, and so, and oddly enough, a few of the things here I stole, I just, I just reached out to him and said, hey, I'm going to be speaking and uh, about practice plans. He's like, ah, he's like, I'll send you my deck. He's like, I'm speaking at, speaking at the coaches convention uh, last Friday night about practice plans um, and, and planning for the season. So a few of these things here I, I stole from him. Uh, obviously, they have a full-time staff of guys that work and do things. Uh, so their practice planning is a little more in-depth than I would assume we're to do at the youth level <laughs> uh, that you'd have time for. So that, that's a little of my background. Um, one, I want to first thank you guys for being here. I think it's awesome that we get guys to come out on a Saturday uh, morning during December. Uh, you know, your parents won't ever tell you, your kids won't ever tell you, but they do appreciate it, right? You're, you're out here getting, you know, giving yourself, uh, making yourself better coaches to help their experience. So uh, I certainly appreciate that, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, they do as well, although they may never, may never say it to you. Uh, so, how to run a great practice every day. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, it's a great topic and that I think we can really, in, if we do the right preparation, we can really impact how we do things for kids and make a better experience for them. So, uh, there's a couple areas that I'm going to kind of focus on today. Uh, as we're going through, please stop at any point and ask questions. We don't need to wait till the end of the question and answer time. So ask questions if something's unclear or where we're going. Um, but we're going to talk a lot about the preparation of, of running a great practice. And I think with everything, that's it. Uh, and when I look at that, I look at it both foundationally and seasonally, right? And, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But how do we you know, really impact these kids in that hour and a half and, and maximize our time with them? Uh, and I think that... that um, <clears throat> I think where it starts is our mindset as coaches, right? Um, what do I want to accomplish for the season, right? And, you know, I mentioned I run a camp up in Wisconsin. And, um, some of this is, is stuff we talk to the college coaches about right then for that five days that we have those kids, right? And first and foremost, uh, you know, if we're going to have a great season and have a, a great, great practice, we got to make sure we're keeping the kids safe, right? And I think that means one... Um, you know, obviously the weather and, and those types of things, but kids meet up, come to us with a lot of different challenges, right? We don't know what's going on in their lives at home, at school, right? And we need to meet them kind of where they are, right? So we need to make sure we're keeping those kids safe and in a good place um, and that this is a good environment for them, right? Second thing is that uh, obviously we want to make them better lacrosse players, right? Wherever they come to us, whether they be, you know, an eighth grader that's really good, whether they be a, a U9 player that's just starting, we want to make them better, right? Um, and, and I think that that goes across to how, you know, when we get into player development, and you'll see a lot of that, and you'll hear a lot of that today with the speakers, uh, and we'll talk about some of that in the practice plan, but how do we make them a better lacrosse player, 
right? How do we make them a better person? Um, and, uh, you know, that is one that, that I'm really big on. Uh, my father was a high school football coach for 33 years. Um, my mother was uh, also a teacher and educator. So, so both of my parents taught at the high school level. Um, and maybe it's a little old school, but I still think there's value in teaching kids how to play sports, right? And, and, and when they play a team sport, the value of competition, the value of, um, you know, uh, hard work and what that means, the value of sacrificing a little bit of yourself for the betterment of the team, right? And we have an opportunity to do that, and you know, those are a lot of things that kids don't always get today, but we have an opportunity to do that in our brief time, right? In that hour and a half, or, you know, two hours that we're spending with them, right, we can teach them some of those life lessons, right? Make them a better person. And, uh, you know, th those are things that I, I really feel, right, deep down, you know, that's one of the reasons why I coach. That's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about it. Um, because I think that sports are great for kids, right? It's been great for, for me and for my family. It's given us lots of opportunities to do things. And, and I think that, you know, it, it helps make better kids. You know, when I hire people in my job, I look for people that were athletes, right? Because I think they have a, the, some of that ability to understand sacrifice and hard work and teamwork and some of the other things that just translate as well. So we want to try to impart some of that. And then most importantly, we want to have fun, right? The National Alliance of Sports will tell you that 70% of kids won't play uh, sports after the age of 13, right? So that means they're dropping out. Some of them are finding other sports. Some of them are finding cars or girls or jobs or whatever the case may be. But when you look at your team of, you know, 20 kids, right, probably only seven or eight of them will ever play through high school. So if we're not giving them a fun experience, if we're not having some fun with those kids, right, why, why are they really there, right? And so you'll see through the practice plan, you know, we want to do some of those things as well. Right? And these are things, you know, I, I coach, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to stay all day today. I'm going to go coach my daughter's eight-year-old basketball team. These are the same types of things I bring to that, right? From, from whether it be uh, basketball or football or soccer or, or, or any other sport, you know, these are foundational things that you say, hey, this is what I want to accomplish with these kids. Right? This is what I want to do by the time the season ends. So as we start to prepare for the season right, and get into that, right, we want to set some rules and some foundations. Um, the first one, you want to keep it as simple as possible. Right? You don't need a lot of rules. The more rules, the more they're going to break them, the harder it gets to you. Right? Uh, I, I keep mine down to two rules. Right? Um, so whatever those rules are that you want to have, right, just keep them simple, but you've got to put some rules in place right, to, that you're going to operate as a team around. Uh, uh, recruit as many people as you can to coach. What are your two rules? So the two rules that I, I put in, um, and it's a little bit of a, a trick question because it goes in depth. The first rule that I put in is that we're going to respect everyone and everything uh, that we come in contact. Right? And then I give them a little bit more explanation with that and what that really means to, to me. Right? When we talk about respect, we're going to respect our coaches. So that means when myself or another coach is talking, they're not. They're listening, they're paying attention, and I know they're doing that by looking at me. Right? We're going to respect our teammates. And what that really means is that, hey, if uh, you know, Mike and I are doing a drill and Mike is, uh, wants to get better and I'm dogging it, am I respecting him because he... You know, he's not getting better if I'm going half speed, right? So I'm going to respect my teammates. Um, we're going to respect my, um, right? And, and how that balloons out into two and three man drills, right? If, if we got four guys out there, uh, you know, and two of them are dogging it, the other two guys are not getting the reps, or even if one is dogging it, right? We're going to respect the officials, right? We talk about there's no need for anybody to talk to an official except for me. I'll do that. We talk about no need to respect, uh, we're going to respect our teammates, or excuse me, our, our opponents. We're not going to say anything other to the opponents other than good, jay, good game, good job. Uh, you know, I think especially with the older kids, that's an important one that they, they hear that. Uh, and then we talk about uh, respect for our parents, right, that they're putting up money, they're putting up time to get them there. The best way to do that is to come here and work hard and get better. 
Uh, and then finally, to the things around us, right? We're going to respect the field that we're on. Uh, by cleaning it up, we're going to leave it better and look better um, than uh, it was when we got right? So we bring a water bottle, it's coming off of us. So we talked about that as rule number one, and there's a lot of parts to it, and, and that was kind of the cliff notes of what I might give to the kids. But um, at the end, I can always go back to, hey, what did we talk about? Respect everything, right? And it, and it really gets to a lot of things. So it's one simple rule, even though there's lots of parts to it. Uh, the second rule that we have is that we're going to have fun, right? And, and those are the two rules that, that, that we have, because I want them to be in a place where they're going to come and, and have some fun with us. And uh, so those are the two things that I, I, I really boil it down to for those kids. Um, the, you know, get as many folks as you can to coach, right? Um, there is, uh, you can use parents to do anything, right? we, we, They don't have to be lacrosse knowledgeable, as long as they're good with the kids. Uh, you know, we do a lot of, uh, you know, you'll see when we get into practices, we'll do a lot of station work and some drill work, right? You know, we bring out ladders, just the agility ladders, right? And we'll have, hey, get through the agility ladder, ladder and pick up a ground ball. You don't need to be a lacrosse coach to know how to do that. Right? You just got to be able to encourage the kids, be positive, and get them going. Right? Uh, as the season goes on, you know, I tell the dads, hey, just listen to what I say and say the same thing. Right? You can get a dad to do one-on-one -on -one ground balls or a mom to do one-on-one -on -one ground balls without having a lot of lacrosse knowledge. Right? And so the more folks that you can get involved, the better off you're going to be. Right? Especially at the younger ages, because there's a little bit of that herding cats mentality. Right? And so, you know, you'll see when we break out into some of the stuff, the structure of practices, it's about having as many people as you can, right? And they don't need to know how to play lacrosse. They just need to be good with the kids, and, and, and we can keep them going from that. So recruit as many as you can, and that starts as early as possible, right? And then what do you want to teach at the end of the season? So we talked about fundamentally what do we want to accomplish, but what are the things that I want to teach, right? And so some of those things might be, hey, at the eighth grade level, it might be, I want to make sure they're in a settled offense and a settled defense, and they understand what we want to do in the last two minutes of a game, right? In a U9 or a U11, it might be, hey, I want to get them in some offensive formation, right? Uh, it, so, so it's really going to vary by what age level you are, but what is it that you want to teach by the end of the day, right? And if it's, hey, I want to get my U13 or my U15 guys into six on six, by the end, that doesn't mean that day one we should be doing six on six, right? We can start at one on one and build our way up to that. Um, but at the end of the season, what is it that I want these guys, or what is it that I think that based on the level that I'm coaching, they should be able to, to do, right? And again, it, it's all gonna vary a little bit there, right? We want to be able to get it, you know, if I'm at a, a U15 or a select level, it maybe I want to be able to get into a 10-man ride. I want to have some man up and man down, right? And then we start working back to how long I have to do that. Um, so when I first came down here, uh, we were in, a, um, we were at, uh, I was helping out in Forsyth County at South Forsyth High School, and they had struggled. Um, and they were, you know, a new program at that point, 12, 15 years ago, and um, had never won more, the first three years hadn't won more than two, three games. And myself and uh, Rick Lewis, who's now at uh, Lambert, he's like, come on, help me out, we'll do it. And we were getting on the bus to go to our first scrimmage down at Centennial, and the kids looked at us and they're like, hey coach, we haven't even put in an offense yet, right? And we've been practicing all this time, so we had spent so much time getting to the, hey, passing and catching and ground balls and building that, that on the bus going to the, the scrimmage, we literally said, here's the formation we want you in on offense, right? And we went through that season. That was, uh, you know, South Forsyth made the playoffs two years ago, and, and I remember reading in the paper they hadn't made it in 12 years. We made the playoffs that year, right? That was the, the last time they had, they had a little drought in between there. But that was a time that we made that play because it was about the fundamentals, right? We, we taught them how to pass and catch and shoot and ground balls and do those things, and that makes a huge difference. Um, 
you know, and so you'll see a lot of that through there is the, the fundamentals, you know. Um, it, my, my brother uh, has said a few times, like, you know, I can have the greatest, ar greatest offense in, in, in the world, but if I can't pass and catch, it doesn't do me a lot of good, right? He's like, I can have two guys throw the ball, one guy scoop it up and shoot it at 100 miles an hour to the top corner, my offense, I look like a genius, right? Because nobody knows the difference. Right? And so you spend a lot of time on that building individuals and building individual skills. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, or excuse me, a few years ago, I listened to Coach Tillman from Maryland do a, a conference, and uh, you know, he talked about they have Maryland Mondays, right? Where on Mondays all they do is individual skills. Right? It's a college level program. On a Monday, they spend the entire day doing individual skill work, right? It just, sometimes we get so focused as, as youth coaches into, hey, we got to teach them six on six, we got to teach them this. Team that passes and catches better is going to win, right? Most of the time. Um, so we, uh, we, we really want to work to get better players, right? And, and not teach plays, that, that's kind of what we hit here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not about winning games. We talk about uh, in getting better, right? I want, I want to see improvement. Uh, and, and again, this is just a small thing. And how do we improve each and every day, right? And I challenge the kids when they leave. What are you going to do to, to improve before you see me again, right? So if we practice on a Monday and we practice on Wednesday, what are you going to do? You're going to get out and hit the wall a little bit. You're going to do something to improve as a lacrosse player before I see you again. Right? And, and I take that theme, try to take that theme throughout the whole season, right? And hey, what are you going to do to get better? Right? What are we going to do? And we just want to keep getting better each and every day uh, as we go through. Not necessarily win games, because in the end, I think we'll get to, the, to win the games. Right? So now as we kind of get into how we structure, uh, I'll pause there a little bit. You know, that, that's some of the mindset from the preparation standpoint. This will get a little more into the structure of how we want to structure a practice, um, and, and what we're trying, what I'm trying to do, and, and what we want to do. We want to have tempo to it, right? We want to have fast uh, practices. We want it to be fun, right? But we got to have some tempo. Keep kids interested. Keep them engaged in the practice, right? Competition. I think that you know the more they're competing, whether it be one-on-one -on -one ground balls whether it be you know, two-on-ones, whatever it may be, I think are great things to keep the kids engaged and they get excited about that, right? So the more things that you, I mean, even when we do partner passes, we do, hey, let's do a minute and see how many you can get right-handed, right? But you and your partner, right? Just a different way to do it. It gets them engaged. It keeps them thinking about that. Teach them a walk-run. This is something we talk to the coaches quite a bit about. Hey. Teach the, teach the drill, right? Teach the idea that we're trying to do. Demo it with a few people, right? Let the kids walk through it before we try to run, right? Try before we're trying to get there. So teach demo, walk, run. We get to that a lot in, in terms of how we're trying to, just from a coaching perspective, what we want them to think about. Use three to five teaching points. Uh, most of the kids, the next two kind of go together. Most of the kids don't, uh, you know, if you talk to them about, 47 things, they're not going to remember it, right? So, boil everything down to three to five teaching points, right? Uh, you know, for example, we teach, talk about inside shooting, right? We talk about the idea of getting your hands back, right? Catch the ball deep as I'm coming across, and then hammer a nail, right? Hammer the nail, coming across, inside shooting. They hear that a thousand times in that practice. Hammer the nail, hammer the nail, right? Catch it deep, hammer the nail. That's it. That's all. Because that, that's those are the things I want them to think about on that inside shot, right? So it becomes, um, you know, if, if we start talking too much about the intricacies of it, they start thinking too much, right? Um, and then the 90, 60, 30, uh, 10 rule, right? 90 percent, uh, 10 percent of uh, excuse me, 10 percent of what we tell the kids um, will be. Um, Got the, the other way on my thought process here. 90% uh, of what we tell them, they will retain an hour after practice. 60% right? of what we tell them, they will retain uh, a day after practice. And 10% of what we tell them, they will retain a week after practice. Right? 
So when we're doing a drill, what are the 10% that I want them to think about a week later? Right? When we do that drill again. Uh, right? If I practice on Monday, what's the 10% that I want them to think about at Saturday's game? Right? And so that's where that three, you know, that three to five things come in, and we repeat it over and over again. Right? And I think it's important that you use the same language, right? Even if it's experienced coaches, you're getting those coaches to say the same thing, right? We talk to, you know, um, at our camps, our coaches, hey, you know, use the same terminology that it was taught, right? So we're all using the same terminology because if we're talking different language, right, the kids walk out of there, what did they learn? I don't know, right? But if we're all saying the same thing and they hear it over and over and over again, we got a better chance of being in that 10% that they're actually going to retain. Okay. Start small uh, and grow. We, we hit on this a little bit, right? There shouldn't be doing six on six in day one, right? We shouldn't be doing right? everything that we want to do. We want to build, have have a pro progression as we go through the season, right? So, you know, to get to six on six, we want to start at one on ones. We want to start, you know, move to two on twos, move to three on three, move to four on four. Right before we grow into six on six. Um, core drills in, in, in a variety. I think that it's really important that uh, we have a variety of drills to keep kids engaged. And I know Coach Mike's going to put out a whole bunch of drills for guys to get the touches to. Um, but this is one that I think there should be a group of core drills that you do that kids can easily get into and start right away without any teaching just so we can maximize our time, right? You know, so we may have two or three core stick work drills, and we may have two or three uh, core ground ball and shooting drills. And so, hey, today I'm going to introduce a new stick work drill. So in my station, you know, that's six minutes, you know, a minute and a half is going to be introducing it, so I'm just only getting four minutes of rep. But in my stick work drill, I'm doing a, a core drill that they know, so I'm getting six full minutes of reps. Right? and getting some extra time there. Does that make sense, right? To have some core drills that they know and, and, and they do, right? and it doesn't have to be one or two, it could be three or four. As they get older, they can be in, uh, you know, it can be fast break drills, it can be, uh, you know, unsettled drills, whatever the case is. In all of these things, I think we want to have some core drills that the kids do enough so that all you have to say is, hey, we're doing three on two continuous, we're doing Ohio State drill, we're doing this, and they know what to get into right away, right? And, and, and there's not any teaching to it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's working the fundamentals, it's getting the reps, it's getting the touches there, and then, you know, every practice we want to have some variety of, well, I'm going to do some of my core drills so I'm getting additional reps, and I want to keep it interesting and fun for the kids, so I'm going to add some new New, new drills in there, new things that they haven't seen, right? Um, partner coaches, this really comes to the idea of having uh, additional coaches there and getting as many people as you can. Um, and, and when I talk about partner coaching, anytime that, you know, especially at camps and things, and, and we, we always try to get more than one coach doing a drill, right? And so if Mike and I are doing the drill, hey, Mike, you're going to do the coaching, I'm going to run the drill, right? So if we're doing one-on-ones um, -on from four corners or from two corners, my job to run the drill is to keep guys doing the drill, right? And one, Mike's job is I'm going to pull kids out and teach, right? Hey, here's what you could have done better defensively if you had taken this angle, right? Well, he's taking those two kids off and teaching, right? I'm still running the drill and getting more kids reps. And if it doesn't always mean, right? Would some of the other kids benefit from that teaching? Absolutely. But if we talk too much, they're, they're, they're going to kind of, right? They're, they're, they're going to fade off on us. So they're going to get much more out of doing than talking. Uh, now, there will be some universal coaching points that we want to be, right? We've had five guys in a row do the same thing wrong. Let's stop the group. Let's talk to the group about fixing that whole thing, right? And, and some overall coaching points. But the more that you can partner coach, and again, this is where coming in with, you know, a dad, uh, you know, that may not have a lot of coaching experience becomes valuable. They can blow the whistle and say go, right? They can get the next guy going, and well, you're pulling kids off and, and actually doing some coaching. So the more partner coaching, the more guys you can get involved to do some of that partner coaching, 
um, I think it becomes helpful to them. Uh, be relentlessly positive. This is, um, this is a term that comes out of Army. Uh, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the numbers say that you need to be positive. A kid, kid will take your criticism or, or critiques much better if you've, given, if you've built up some, some goodwill with them, right? And so we try to talk, you know, I try to talk to kids all the time. Hey, great job, Gary, on that ground ball way to get your stick down, right? And it's got to be specific. Right? And using your name. Hey, way to be the first guy over here after the water break. Right? Good job on this. And so over time, I'm actively looking to compliment the kids on anything. Right? Doesn't matter what it is. Being the first guy here, having their hands down on the ground ball. Hey, great catch on that one. I love the soft hands. Right? Way to put the ball on a stick. Right? And we start to build up that bank of goodwill, and they become more receptive to our coaching then when it comes, right? So when I do have to deliver, you know, hey, I need you to do this, I need you to take a better turn there, right? They've got, oh, okay, I got it. I'm willing to listen to that because coaches, you know, built up a, 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 a positive bank of, you know, 10 or 15 positive, so they're, so they're more willing to do that. So be relentlessly positive, again, as much as you can be specific about it, right? As much as you can be, uh, use your name to it, great job, Love to see it. Love to see what we're doing there. Right? Helps helps as we go through. So, uh, continuing kind of from a, a practice structure, especially at the youth level, um, what try to practice with the same groups, same age group as much as possible. Right. So what we have here is that, you know, if we had, this is an example uh, from Cambridge of our U11s last year, right, we had three teams, right, and on each of those teams we divide them out evenly, I have my A players, my B players, my C players, and my D players, right, and then we break them out into four groups additionally, right, so although you're a member of this team, here are the four station groups is what we call them, um, and we put all of our A players across there, all of our B players, all of our C, and all of our T players, right? And really the thought behind this is that, you know, especially in the youth, we're trying to get as many new kids involved in, in, in bringing new kids into the program. Um, if I have a brand new kid coming in, having him go against a kid that has been playing for three years or four years doesn't do either of them any good, right? Neither of them get any better. The, young, the, the brand new guy gets frustrated, he's not getting any reps, or you know, he can't do it, he can't hear. The new guy is frustrated because, well, that was kind of easy for me, right? And so when we go, and we'll get into some typical practice type stuff, but so with my A guys, right, my group one, I may be able to do passing and catching, and we're going to do some offhand stuff, and we're going to do it, uh, you know, a little bit more advanced here. With my new guys, I'm doing something that's a little easier, right? Maybe they've had a sick in their hand for two weeks or three weeks. So I'm going to do something, and I'm going to teach them a little bit differently. We're all doing the same drills. We're all doing the same things. But we're really just tailoring within that drill on how we do it. Right? And what you'll see is that even when we get into six on six, right, we're going to try and take group one and two and do six on six, three and four, do something else. And then we're going to swap it. Right? Because again, even in a six on six situation, I think it becomes even more apparent, right? If, uh, you know, um, Mike is really good and, and I'm not, Mike's probably not going to pass to me in that six on six situation. Right? And so now all of a sudden I'm just not getting any touches there. I don't get a chance to do some things, right? If Mike and I both aren't very good and we're in it together, you know, and I say this, hey, we're still developing, right? Um, Hey, I'm gonna pass to him because I don't know any better, right? You know, and so it, it helps those kids that you know get reps, get touches that are actually meaningful within it, uh, within the situation. Uh, you know, so we try and do this. This works equally well with two teams if you can do it, right? Maybe have three social <coughs> groups, and um, it, we all. I also do it even. You know, my uh, my daughter's um, basketball team. You know, there's, there's 10 girls, we still do three groups of stations out of that 10 groups, right? 
just because there's two or three that are a little bit older, a little bit more skilled. There's three of them that this is their first year playing basketball, right? and we rotate through the drills and do things. But it just gives it more. It makes it more fun for them, right? And certainly through a lacrosse season, these are fluid, right? We move kids up and down a little bit here, right? Um, and we don't. You know, I did this for simplicity. As you can tell, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a whiz with the uh, PowerPoint, right? It's all black and white on one screen. It's not a lot there. <laughs> um, but we don't, you know, and, um, at Cambridge, you know, because we do the Bears, right? So we have Grizzlies, Kodiak, and uh, I don't know what the other Bear team was. And then we go by color on the bottom end, right? So we don't. We're not calling them out groups, group one, group two, group three, so they think there's any difference there. We call them out Carolina, white, black, and navy um, from that standpoint. But I think that the more you can do that, it really, you know, this is a big one that uh, we have seen a lot of, a lot of success with at Cambridge since I started making them go this way, right? And, and since we started doing things this way. Uh, and just in terms of our player development, and the better kids are, are continuing to get better and get pushed, and the new kids are having a good experience, and, and it's amazing how quickly the new kids, right, start to develop when they're when they're being taught at their level, right, Coach, as opposed to that. Um, the model we have here, uh, how many players total are at this practice, uh, and how many are in roughly each group at Cambridge? Yep. So uh, for for our fall for our spring team here, we had 16 on each of these teams. So we were at about 10 each of those groups, uh, each of the station groups, uh, given, um, so that, that we had 38 kids, uh, no, uh, 48 kids. So we were at 10, and you know, with most youth programs, we have kids that aren't there days, lots of days, right? So we would end up around 10 per group, right? Uh, the way that we also started is our better kids, we sometimes get a little bit bigger groups just because we can do more with them. Right, our group four or our, our lower players. If we can keep those groups smaller, we try to, just so they get more individual attention, right? And it accelerates their 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 learning. Right? And the coaches travel the groups or stay at the station. We have coaches stay at the station, right? So so again, it, the kids don't feel any difference there. Uh, and then the other thing I think that comes to is, you know, I recognize the challenge that. Not all the lacrosse coaches that are out there that we have have ever played lacrosse, right? You know, some of those parents and some of that. And so it's easier for me to teach them one thing and for them to understand one thing and then just run that same drill four times. That makes sense, right? As opposed to have them have to learn four different things. So from a coaching recruiting standpoint, it's a selling point to them. Hey, just tell, tell them what I tell you. Here, here's the easiest things to do, right? And, and we can... Uh, we can get that coach doing something they're comfortable with and they excel at, right? Good questions. Other questions? So, uh, real quick, sorry, when you put the kids back together on the field to teach or back in their team scenario to work, do you still find that the eight players are loath to play it, throw it to the kid from the No, because we, we, we try to get them, um, because the guys, uh, I mean, that's always going to happen at any new sport, right? <laughs> that's just the way they, they are. Uh, but it, I will say that in the teams that we had, especially last year, they were, you know, we talk a lot about making the right pass anyways, right? So do the right thing, even if he doesn't catch it, and we praise that, right? Hey, awesome pass, that's the right thing to do, because that's what we want him to do, as opposed to, well, I just throw it to him. Right? Even though that kid might not have caught it, and you know, as a coach, it becomes a little bit frustrating. Uh, we had a kid that was brand new and probably was a lacrosse player because he couldn't play other sports, right? Uh, and we threw him the ball every single time, and he never caught it. And I'm like, what are we doing? I mean, I didn't say that to the kids, but like, as a coach, you're like, we got an opportunity. And I'm like, um, so no, and I think that they do. Um, you know, if we're teaching them, because we're teaching them all the same thing, they can back, integrate quickly back into their teams, right? Um, and then it also, you know, sometimes to a fault, our guys were very good about passing, making the right pass, right? You see the smaller programs don't have 40 kids like the same age. Yep. 
have you seen the utility in mixing, let's see, the U13 and the U11? And you mix those teams together and did this subdivision. Have you seen any? Absolutely. Right. So if you can do the same practice times, a U13 and a U11, assuming that you know some of your U11s are uh, good enough to play with some of your better U13s, right? Absolutely, I think that's a great way to do that. You can still even do this within a team concept, right? You're going to have, you know, if you only have 20 kids, right? You still want to do stations, and so you're going to have six or seven to a station. I would still break them out in this type of format with your A's, your B's, and your C's uh, there. But absolutely, I think you can go across boards. Uh, I, I think it comes a little tougher U9 to U11 because it's a different game, right? The, the U9s are playing on a shorter field. But the U11 to U13 where they're still playing 10 on 10, they're still playing, um, you know, that bigger field. I think it, absolutely you can do that. Uh, and, and it gives this very similar experience to it. So, so did your A's play with your D's at all in practice? We do things, some things as a team towards the end, but not a lot. Not a lot. Right? So you just know. on game day, basically. Yep, it's coming through on game day. I mean, we do things um, as a group. Uh, you know, we'll do rides and clears together, right? Uh, you know, as a team. When we get into that, we'll do some six on six together as a team, uh, but not not a lot, <coughs> right? Um, so, how many coaches do you have running? with uh, 48 players and three separate teams and multiple stations? How many people do you need? Do you have a ratio you try to achieve? So, it's like as many as I can get. <laughs> How's that, right? Um, you know, so we are, uh, again, because we really, we, we're pretty actively recruiting, um, you know, the coaches and, and asking, uh, it, it all varies. I've been years where it's been, um, myself and one other guy, you know, and so with 48 teams, we have three head coaches and two assistants that go across three teams, so there's five of us across there, right? I've had years where we have, you know, 14 coaches for 48 kids, right? Uh, and again, it's, it's a lot, you know, of those 14 coaches, uh, probably two have played the cross, three have played the cross, but at least, and I say that, they're not there every day, right? You know, it, it, with all things, people travel, work, other things, and so they're kind of in and out. But if we had our full complement, we would have all 14. Right. So it, it goes back to that recruiting. It, it's not a, you know, the more you can have, the better, right? And, and that's why, uh, you know, that's why I was one of those first ones, recruit as much as you can, as often as you can. But ideally what you want to do is you want to have two coaches at each one of those stations so that one can coach and one can run the drill. If possible, yeah. Yep. And, and you'll see in the practice uh, as we go, the, the more coaches we have, the better, right? And so if we look at a, a typical practice here, I think it's next, right? So a typical early season practice um, for us, right? And I just threw in some random times here. Uh, set the expectation for practice. This might have been me as a player. Um, I just hated going into the next hour and a half. I have no idea what's happening. So I like to tell the kids exactly what we're going to do. Hey, we're going to do some stations. We got some stick work, uh, some individual stations. Right? Then we're going to do a little bit more detailed station, round stations. We're going to get into some four on four and two on two scramble. That's what our day looks like. Just something like that. Right, let's get out there, let's work hard, right, give them a little bit of motivation, but tell them what we're going to do for the next hour and a half. So they're, they're not blindsided by it. Um, some type of warm-up, again, relatively quick there, uh, whether it be a dynamic stretch, whether it be some stuff going at half speed. And then we would get into four stations by five minutes. Right? So these are quick individual skill stations. We're going to do a partner pass one, a shooting, a speed ground ball of one, and then another stick work on the move. So a breakout pass, something like that. Okay? And if I look at those, again, these are quick hitters. These are things that are going to go pretty quickly in, in how we do it. Um, lots of touches, lots of reps. Right? So if I look at partner pass, today for my A group, we're going to go all offhand. Right? For my D group, we're going to go all strong hand, right? just so we're starting to develop that. Right? For the groups in between, we'll probably go half and half, right? because I can't get my guy that's not catching with a strong hand. You know, 
let's, let's work out, let's walk before we can run, right? So we're going to go through a quick hit. These are, these are quick stations, really focused on individual skills, right? Developing the individual uh, skills. Right? Then we're going to go into another round of stations. These are a little bit longer, a little more teaching here, right? So we're going to go one-on-one -on -one to the goal, right? We're going to do a two-on-one to, uh, two -on -one to the goal, a scoop and help drill, one-on-one -on -one, on one ground ball. Again, still fundamentals, so you'll see, you know, we talked about the beginning. So the first hour of our practice of an hour and a half is still all fundamental drills, but now we're just getting a little bit more details to it. In upstate New York model, that's the work. Yep. <laughs> you know, first hour of our hour and a half is all about the fundamentals, right? But we're just going through stations. And, you know, we can put some variety here, and I thought about this this morning after I'd done it, you know, uh, how you do it. I'm a big station guy. I just, I like how that works. I like that we can get smaller groups. Um, I think it gives it the opportunity for um, the coaches that, you know, like yourself, that are knowledgeable to get touches with all of the kids, right? To get the opportunity to deal with all the kids and help all the kids. Um, and then we're going to go take our two groups and we're going to do some four on four. So we're going to do a little bit more teaching here. Right? Uh, a good way to start implementing here. And, and, and now we've built up a little bit. And we're going to do a two on two scramble, uh, which is just a two on two ground ball, which now we got to locate. Whoever gets the ball gets to go to the goal. Right? So now we got to start to locate. We got to think about moving the ball off the ground, right? Making an extra pass, how we want to deal with that and getting into a two on two. Right? So well, then we go again. So this is still allowing my better kids to, to compete with my better kids. And you guys to still have an opportunity to play, right? You know, and where you see this in a two-on-two -two scramble, if I have my D's and my A's together, the D's don't ever get involved in that game, right? The A guy comes up and picks it up and makes a pass, and then it's over, right? And, and, and it does, he never gets involved. So it allows that to happen. We'll swap groups, and then we have it all up. Uh, you know, this may have come partly from my, my folks, my parents on the teacher side. We told them what we were going to do, and we want to review things. Right? Hey, here are some of the new things that we learned. Here are some of the things that we could work on before we meet again. Right? A little bit of uh, all up at the end. So that would be something that we might look at in an early uh, season practice. Again, very heavy on the new stuff or uh, on the individual skills. Mm -hmm. right. If we move towards the, the end of it, right, uh, or towards the middle of the season, right, Again, the same thing, I, I'm a believer of always talking to them first, right? Not wasting time on that. Uh, we get the warm up to get us going. Again, you'll see those four stations by five minutes, right? It's just, that's the way we start practice with individual skills. For 20 minutes, we're doing some type of individual skills. You'll see again, nothing. Um, this is where maybe a variety of one, this is, you know, Sure, Coach Mike's got tons of drills, right? With lots of things that you're going to get touches here. You can do any number of ways to, to, do, to do those and keep that interesting. Then we're going to do a little bit more uh, um, lengthy stations here in 11 or 12 minutes. So you say, hey, you're only playing six on six for 12 minutes, but I'm doing that three times, right? So as opposed to, I'm going to have 12 kids there that are actually playing six on six, as opposed to 12 kids playing six on six and 10 other ones sitting there goofing off, pretending to listen, right? So they're all getting actually 12 minutes of playing time, as opposed to if I do it for 30 minutes with the whole group, right? Some are going to get, you know, any number of 8 to 10 to 15 minutes of it, but they're all going to get 12 minutes of playing time, and then they're going to move, right? And again, a little bit of a mix here as we go into a four-on-three to the goal, just in a stationary position, you know. A, a, a ground ball that I had one, right? So again, a little bit more middle of the season, a little bit more uh, in depth in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. So you you assign the kids their group at each practice? No, so we signed them at the beginning of the year. Right? And, and we just said, hey, you're Navy, you're Carolina, you're Blue. And again, it, it was floating. I mean, there's some kids that move from one to the other. Uh, typically up, not typically down, um, and you'll have to move some kids just because, you know, today, you know, Navy's got 12 kids and Carolina's got eight because just the way kids are out. So, hey, we're just, just for today, you're going to go down with that group, so we got 10 and 10. 
Jason, what, at what point do you uh, start getting kids in eight uh, positions specific? Like uh, everybody plays defense, four quarter. Every, with, so, uh, you know, we, I think there's a value to having kids play as many positions as possible for as long as possible, right? I think they naturally start to select through sixth and seventh grade. We still play through sixth and seventh grade. We still rotate positions, right? Um, as much as possible. Our select teams a little bit less, but we still give kids. Uh, and, and when I say rotate, um, that might mean you know he's going to play midi most of the game, but we're going to give him one run on defense, right? It's not a true like U nine where hey you get two minutes at midi, two minutes here, two minutes there. Uh, you know, and I, and I say that because I, there's hundreds of hundreds of examples uh, of this that, that you can go across the board. Um, but, but I'll give one specific, uh, you know, Rick Lewis Jr. Um, played at St. Tyus High School, um, was an All-American there. He went on to uh, Ohio State, was the team captain, uh, was an assistant, uh, came back, was an assistant at Lambert. He's now... Uh, uh, the volunteer assistant at Army. But uh, Rick was a uh, post up right hand shooter in high school media in college. <laughs> <laughs> but not only that, uh, if, if anybody's had an opportunity to watch Rick shoot the ball, I mean, he shoots the hell out of the ball, right? I mean, he can, it, it's it, a clinic in how to shoot the ball hard, both hands, excellent. His first year as a, as a college player, he was a defensive mid because he was a good enough athlete. His second year, he was a defense. They started moving him a little bit. He was a defensive mid, right? It wasn't until his third year, right, when he was a youth player, right? Because I, I coached Rick when he was in fifth grade. He was an attacker, right? His first year at, uh, at St. Pius, he was an attacker, right? So having that understanding, right? But he was also a kid that would pick up a long pole and do things and play. He played some goalie. He do whatever it was, right? So. You know, we, we get very settled in these things, and you know, so the longer you can do it, uh, you know, and involved at the high school program. I mean, we have, um, you know, I do some stuff with the summer and in the fall with them, and talking to the high school coach, and, and it's like, you know, he's going to be a JV player as a midfielder. If you want to play long pole, many probably be on the varsity, right, as a sophomore, right. And so there's opportunities for guys if they want to do it. So the more we can teach them, and, and then the second point to that is that I, I'm a firm believer that if, you know, if I'm an attackman and I understand what the defenseman is trying to do, it makes me that more successful in attacking it, right? And the same goes if I'm a defenseman and I understand what an offense is trying to do, I'm that more uh, able to process and, and, and cut them off and prevent them from doing it. Good question. There, there's a reality there, though, right? You can only do that with yeah. yeah, 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 there are, yes, there are, there is a reality there, right? And so we do, you know, especially at the youth level, right, there's certain kids that have to play more midfield than anything else just because you have to be able to get the ball up, right? Otherwise, it's a bad experience for everybody because the ball sits on your defensive end the whole time, right? And so, so you've got six kids that never get to do anything on the offensive end. So you have to have certain kids that play uh, more offense than, than defense, right? But there's also the reality of a game, um, you know, every time you're going to be down, there's going to be a season you're going to be down 10 goals, there's going to be, in the season you're going to be up 10 goals, right? Those are chances to get guys, right? Doesn't matter if you lose by 10 or if you lose by 12 or 15, right? Get those guys getting some additional reps at other positions, because you never know what might happen, right? So I noticed in your practice plans, you really don't have any section of the cleaned out for like game situations like you know so if you're going to work on a ride, you're going to work on Yeah, so that would happen in the three on two continuous here at the end. Right? So at the end we do a three on two continuous. Uh, some of you probably refer to it as West Jenny, but being an upstate New York kid that lost to West Jenny twice a year for four years of high school, we call that three on two continuous. Right? And this is the only place that it's called West Jenny in Georgia. I don't know how that came or where it came about, but we call that three on two continuous or basketball. Um, so that would happen in that last 25 minutes there if we were going to do rides and clears. Right? We'd do some team specific stuff there. Um, that was just an example out of that one. Um, but certainly, you know, I think that, again, it little depends on age level, right? 
when we talked about going back from the start to the to you know and what you wanted to accomplish, right? Rides and clears with a U11 team. I put it in the day before the game, right? Because it's really about passing and catching, and if they can get to the right spot and pass and catch, right? We we can work on that a little bit more as the season goes, but we don't spend a ton of time because at the end, if they can pass and catch, it's it's it, a lot of the same principles of cutting to get open, right? In offense, you just do it in a bigger space on the right and clear, cut to get open, catch the ball, and, and move it up. Other questions? What about like uh, special situations like face-offs and wing play, one man, a man up, man down? So we do, um, again, really depending on the, the, the team, right? So at a U13, a select team, a U15, Right, we take care of some of that in, in here, uh, and, and some of that, you know, these are um, practice plans that were off of U11. So during that second round of stations, we would do that. Right, uh, face off. Uh, typically, we try to pull those guys uh, out during that second round of stations. With the young kids, we actually do. We'll do a face off station in that four by five minutes, right? Just to see who's has the, the aptitude to do it, and right, they all want to try it. So, so we can do a lot of work on that um, through there. And you know, it, it, as much as you can, uh, you know, we try to bring those kids in early if they can come or stay late. Right? They can get there for 10 minutes, and I can get a few kids doing some face-offs for 10 minutes before, just to, just to benefit, right? Uh, same with the goalies, right? And again, you know, a lot of that is, you know, we pull some goalies out during some of those situations to, to see some shots and, and do, get warmed up. One of the things we started doing, and we put face-offs in everyone in, in a lot of our drills. So every kid was getting reps at face-off. I'm talking about youth kids. Yep. Because at that point, you're not stuck with the face-off kids sick, got the flu. Yeah. It's gone. I don't have anybody else that's ever done it. Plus, you don't know the the eleven year old of today that's an average player may be the greatest face off guy that's ever lived by the time he's a sophomore. Correct. Yeah, you know, uh, and that may be where they find their niche. It, it's you know, and that, that's part of it is why you know you keep developing those kids. There's a, a kid, Colin Massa, uh, who's at uh, Mercer, he's a defenseman at Mercer, and and Colin's a great kid and uh, played at Lambert. But I had Colin when he was a fourth grader. If you told me he would be a Division One athlete, I would have been furthest kid from the wreck, right? I mean, I, I remember he was one of the first teams that we had from Begadaway up at uh, up at Sharon Springs Park, and he was just this little small kid, didn't say a word, and like, you go be a Division One, you won't look at him now, right? Um, but you know, that, that's partly keeping it fun and keeping him involved, so that, that a kid like that stays with it, with it. I do you, I have a quick question since you. Just because you developed a program, you know, the, uh, we have a, a lone little township, and so we're struggling against the outer edges, taking away all the players from us. And the uh, we we can put like one and a half teams together a year. We're relatively competitive with that one team, but the, the other half is just kind of extra. Where where is this? City of Decatur. Okay. We're own little school um, in the middle of the Cap County. Yep. But the. Uh, the how do you go about recruiting since you started this program to know with a bunch of kids who never played lacrosse? I mean, we win state in soccer every year, and that's who we're competing against. Is that kind of everybody plays soccer? Yep. So um, you know, if you you know, we do a lot of recruitment at the elementary um, schools. How you, are they letting you come in and do active recruiting? So you know, you got to just work the parents. So it's, you got to work the parents and, and get there. Uh, in Forsyth County, they let any teachers' kids play for free, right? Uh, as a way to kind of get the parents coming through. The other thing I think that the um, that we do is we do a learn to play clinic where we get soft balls. Uh, so all they have is a um, all they require is a stick, right? And it's a soft ball stick. We do it for boys and girls, right? It's just teaching the fundamentals. So it's a cheap way for them to do it. We charge uh, I think seventy five dollars. We do it Sunday afternoons for an hour and a half, right? And primarily, we're getting first, you know, kindergarten, first, and second graders, and the idea to develop them and put them into um, into that, right? So that's a good way. We can talk about that a little bit offline. I think I'm down to one slide, here, Coach. Yeah. Uh, 
Show it so I get it on my video. Yeah. Uh, just a random thoughts, right? Um, I'm not a big conditioning fan. I think if you run your practice really well, you keep them moving and going, uh, that, that you don't need to do conditioning. But if you're going to do conditioning, do it with a purpose and don't save it to the end. Nobody likes to have that hanging over their, per over their head. But I say do it with a purpose. When we do conditioning, we don't go to water right after, right? So I'm going to do some sprints, and then we're going to partner pass immediately so you get used to practicing and passing and catching tires. Right, just for two minutes, right? But my guys know that if we're doing sprints, right off the bat, we're at 10 yards partner passing before water comes for two minutes, right? So do it with a purpose. Don't just condition and then let them go get water because I, I don't know that they get much out of it. Um, this is more for the coaches, dressed for the end of practice. I was in a coach's clinic, one of the first ones we did with Big Attaway back at the warehouse, that somebody gave us this, and it's, it's right, you know, at five o'clock, Sun's out and it's nice. 6.30 in February and all of a sudden it's a lot colder. Dress for the end of practice, not the beginning. Right? Like, you'll be a lot better. Uh, I know, uh, you know, be ready early on time to start. And lead by example, this is a, probably a pet peeve of mine through some of the camps and things that we do. Right? Um, it's tough for us to say to a kid, hey, I need you focused when I'm talking. And yet, while they're doing the drill, I'm on my phone looking here and doing something. Right? And I understand that we're doing this, right? Uh, it's tough for us to say to a kid, hey, I need you hustling, but I'm sitting on a bucket rolling ground balls out. Right? It's tough for me to be, um, you know, so lead by example. Right? We, we, you know, when we run things, right, we require them to be in sneakers, be in some type of drill, uh, athletic shorts so they can show the demo for, for, for kids. Right? You can't be on the phone, you can't be checking that, you can't be distracted and then expect them to do something uh, for you, right? So lead by the example there um, with, with everything that you're doing and I think you're going to get them engaged more on that. Um, this, I, I like this, I'll leave this up and then I think the last one is just my, uh, my um, that might be my parents' influence coming through. But, but there's my contact information. Go ahead. Quick question. How, how do you, so for those folks that you work with that are not familiar with the game, but are, are new to the game, and for what, whatever reason, in a station or a drill, they are doing the drill wrong, do you stop at that point in time and correct what they're doing? Or do you wait till they go to water, pull the coach aside and say, hey, next time